Welcome to CMU 15445 645, Introduction to Database Systems. My name is Andy. I'm the instructor for this course. As I said on Piazza, I can't be in Pittsburgh right now. We are getting ready for Matt's cage fight on Wednesday. So we out, had to be out here in LA to prepare for, for that fight. Um, so rather than just not having classes this, this entire first week, I wanted to record this while, while I'm on the road, post it online, and then that way, uh, when we start having in-class lectures next week, right, we, can, we can get started on the, on the good stuff. So before we get into today's lecture, uh, I first want to talk about how uh, Oracle is helping us out this semester with course, uh, course development. So Oracle is actually one of the first relational database management systems that came out in the 1970s, and I'll explain what a relational database is in, in a few slides. Um, so again, it was one of the original ones, but it's still widely used and sold today, right? It's probably the second most uh, deployed database system in the world. It's certainly the most deployed commercial system in the world. And so even though it's from the 1970s and there's other systems from the 1970s that are still sort of around, Oracle is actually still under active development and they're adding a lot of you know, interesting new modern features to it. So this course is about the, what I'll call it, maybe it's traditional database management systems or classical design. Uh, and it'd be interesting to see when they come at the end of the semester to give a guest lecture and talk about some of the stuff that they're adding to Oracle today, you know, how, how they sort of go beyond, you know, what, what we'll talk about in this course and sort of looking at more, uh, more advanced topics. So the, for this lecture here, I want to first talk about the, sort of the overall uh, outline of what's expected in the course for you as the student taking it. Um, and then we'll finish up giving sort of a half lecture on the relational model and the relational algebra. And this sort of be the background that you need to have for the various topics we'll, we'll, we'll discuss throughout the rest of the semester. So if you're, if you're a student at Carnegie Mellon, then the, probably the, the foremost thing that's on your mind is the wait list. So unfortunately this year they gave me a smaller classroom in Margaret Morrison than I wanted. So that means we can't take a large number of people. Uh, I think the max, it says max capacity is 100. I think it's like 96 is in the room. We can, we can flood that number a little bit, but I mean, the main takeaway is here, we can't accept everyone. So the wait list now I think is 150 when I checked earlier today. So unfortunately, that means that if you're not enrolled in the course at this point, the likelihood that you're going to get in is is very low. I mean, people will drop the course over the over the next week or so, and then we'll take people off, off the wait list. But I, I, unfortunately, I just can't take everyone. So you're more than welcome to audit the course. Just let me know that you're auditing. Um, but we can't officially hold that have that many people. So the way we will enroll students uh, as current students drop out will be just on your, uh, your waitlist position on S3, the, on the registrar's website. So again, I'm sorry, but it's just everything's available online, so you're more than welcome to follow along if you want. All right, so 15.425.645 is, at its core, the course is about the design and implementation of database management systems. So that means that this is not a course on how to use a database. Uh, to build like an application, like a website or something like that, or how to actually administer a database, how to deploy one, set one up. We're not doing any of that. We're, we're really focusing on how do you actually build and design the software that is, is, is a database management system. So if that's not what you're looking for, if you're not looking to know how to, how to build a database management system, then there's two other courses that you, you, you should consider at CMU that are outside of SCS. And the one in particular you might want to look at is 95703 at the Heinz College, which I think is information systems. And again, that's about how to like set up and administer a database management system, but you don't really understand, they don't really go into details about how you actually built the software. The other thing too that people often ask is about, there's a, used to be another course at CMU uh, 15, 415, 615, something that I and Professor Christos Falutis has taught in the past. That is not being offered this semester. I don't know whether it's going to be offered in the spring, probably unlikely. Um, so the, right now, I think the only courses available in SES would be uh, this course, 445, and then 826 in machine learning, uh, machine learning or cross listed with the CS department. Um, so again, it's, it's there's only you know there's there's only Chris and myself we can't teach everything so unfortunately there's there's no other database class other than, than this one. All right, so 
the course outline is that we're going to be going through and discussing the you know how to build a disk oriented database management system, uh, and I'll explain what a disk oriented system is in a, in a few lectures. But basically, we're we're just writing data out the disk. We assume the database is on disk. So it's sort of broken up. The outline for the the topics we'll be discussing is broken up sort of into layers of the system, right? So we'll talk at a high level what, what, what relational databases are. And then we'll talk about how to store them, how to execute queries on them, how to run transactions on them, how to recover them if there's a crash or we, if we need to restart the system. So up to that point, up to recovery, that's the core knowledge you need to have to understand how a database management system works. And then from there, we can then build on that and start talking about more, uh, you know, so more advanced topics like distributed databases or various other types of databases that are out there um, or extensions of relational databases. So again, like the way to think about this is we'll go through every single layer of how to actually build the system and we'll finish up with recovery. And so at that point, we, that's the basic you need to understand of how a database system works. And then we'll talk about how to, you know, how to extend them to scale them up or scale them out or running them in, running them in, in the cloud environment. So the right now, the course website is online uh, along with the syllabus and the schedule. So the basic outline, there's a, there should be a lecture uh, twice a week. And then with each lecture, there's a uh, there's readings that go along with it that, that are supplemental that extend the kind of things that uh, that I'll be talking about, as well as also provide some, some course notes, which I'll mention in a second. So uh, at all times, please refer to the course webpage. That should be up to date, uh, you know, uh, have the up most up to date information on what's going on. So. Uh, and unfortunately, we always have to talk about academic honesty. I'll go a little bit more detail what I mean about this as we go along. Um, but when you ever have a question and you don't know maybe what the right thing to do is, please contact me um, so that we can discuss whether what you're doing could be considered uh, uh, you know, plagiarism or stealing somebody else's work. Right. So in general, again, this is an advanced course, so everyone should be aware that you don't copy code you find randomly on the Internet. You don't copy from each other. But just you know, be very careful because we will check for these things. And as I said, all the discussion and announcements for projects, lectures, uh, homeworks will be on Piazza. We'll do grading with Gradescope. Um, your final grade will be posted on Canvas because that's what CMU wants. But the the day to day discussion will be on Piazza. And there's a link on the course webpage now that that'll take you to our our, our page. There is a textbook assigned for this for this class, um, Database Systems Concepts. So this is actually a new edition that came out this year. I've looked at pretty much every single database systems textbook that, that's out there. In my opinion, this one's actually the, the best one. Um, it's, it's, it's the most up to date. Uh, and as I said, we'll, I'll provide lecture notes for topics that aren't covered in the textbook. Um, I have to admit, the, I haven't looked into detail of, of the seventh edition to understand how much it differs from the sixth edition. So if you want to get the sixth edition, I'm fine with that. I don't think there should be any major difference. I just may not know exactly how to. You can look at last semester's chapter, last semester's, or sorry, last year's course and see for the different topics what the chapter numbers because they, they have changed. And I'm actually not sure whether you, you can buy this book anymore. Like you can't buy it as a bound book. They they sent me. You know, a bunch of page loose loose pages with you know three three ring hole punches in them. So I, I don't know what the bookstore has. I don't know whether it's available online. Um, in the sixth edition, but it's probably good enough, right? We won't we won't be we won't be doing any homeworks or any any problems out of the book directly, right? We'll 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 provide everything for you. All right. So the breakdown for your grade in the class will be the following. So homeworks will be fifteen percent. Then it will be course projects, which I'll discuss in a second. That'll be 45%. So for those of you that are uh, CS undergrads, because the project grade, your final grade is, is comprised of 45% of projects, that's why this course counts for the uh, system software elective for, for the CS undergrad curriculum. Uh, and then there'll be a midterm and final exam, both at 20%. And then there'll be an extra credit, which I'll announce in a few weeks you can get an additional 10% uh, bonus points. And that's, again, that's entirely optional. So there'll be five homeworks throughout the semester. Um, the first one will be a SQL assignment. You'll, we'll give you a SQL-like database. You have to write some queries for us. Um, but then everything after that will be pencil and paper because uh, it's sort of a way to work through the, the sort of more theoretical side of, of, of some of the things that we're talking about. 
Um, but it'll be like filling out multiple choice and then you just take a picture of it and upload it to create grade scope and we'll, we'll provide grades that way. Um, so again, the first assignment is SQL just because, all, you know, we actually won't be writing SQL for the rest of the semester because the course projects don't require it. And I think it's just good for you to guys to, to touch it at least once, um, at least more of the advanced stuff we'll talk about next, next semester. So again, it goes without saying all these homeworks should be done individually as well as the projects, but I just want to emphasize this that like you're not allowed to work in groups and try to figure things out. It's not like a theory class. You know, all these assignments can be done uh, and should be done individually. All right, for the projects, uh, this is the one I'm, I'm pretty excited about. So throughout the course of the semester, you will build your own database storage manager from scratch. So you'll start adding you know, pieces one by one and start building out a sort of full featured database storage manager. So the keyword there is storage manager and not a database system because you're, you're not going to be able to run SQL or have a query parser or, or planner, but you'll be able to run queries that are hand coded that will provide you. So it's, 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 it's more complex than sort of like you know, a simple key value store, but it's not like a full fledged system. So the key thing about this is that it's very important for you to uh, you know, keep keep up to date with the projects because every project is going to build after one after another. So you sort of have to have the first project working correctly in order for the second project to work correctly and the third and so forth. Um, so this particular system that we're using this semester is written entirely in C++17. Um, it doesn't mean we're using all the advanced features of C++17. It just means that uh, it's, you know, it's not like your, you know, the C++ 99, the sort of traditional C++ you may have learned in other classes. So because this is Carnegie Mellon, uh, and I assume this is an advanced class, I'm not, and nor the TAs are, are going to be teaching you or, or teaching how to write or debug C++. I sent out the self-exam on Piazza. If you feel like you're uncomfortable with, you know, the sort of the gnarly aspects of C++, then you know, should try to figure out how, you know, try to start learning this stuff now. Um, but you can't come to us at the TA's office hours and say, hey, you know, what does this stack trace mean? Uh, you know, the, the, this time is really spent to, to be discussing the sort of the, the more high level important database concepts that you're trying to implement in your code. So the, all the projects this year uh, will be implemented on this new academic system that we've been working on called BusTub. So all the source code will be released on GitHub. Um, and of course, obviously, it won't have the implementation of the piece that you're supposed to implement, uh, but you'll sort of fill that in. So at a high level, it's a disk-based or disk-oriented database management system that'll support Volcano-style query processing. Um, different parts of the system have a sort of a pluggable API so that we can plop in different you know, uh, replacement algorithms or different, uh, different index data structures or different logging schemes or control schemes. So it's designed to be that way so that every year we'll switch up the projects entirely um, and have it be different from one year to the next. And we'll slowly build out the system further and further with new features, new functionality, so that you know, after a couple of years, we'll have a full-fledged database management system. So you guys are sort of the first ones starting off with, uh, with these first set of projects and then next year we'll, we'll modify them and it'll, it'll be different, right? So for this, for this reason, we can make it open source because uh, I'm not worried about people, you know, people next year finding your, your crappy projects implementations and, and copying their code because all the projects will be entirely different. So this is what I was saying before, on the last slide that you're building basically a storage manager. The database system doesn't support SQL at this point and nor will it this, this semester. Um, but you'll be able to write queries, but you'll write them in... Um, sort of a physical operator form rather than, in, you know, in SQL and then translate them because it's not something we're doing just yet. So the name of the system is BusTub. Uh, I will explain offline what, what that means, um, but we, we had a nice logo, logo made. Uh, and again, we'll, we'll announce this on GitHub. We'll post it in a, the link on Piazza in, in, in a week or two when we announce the first project. So we're pretty excited about having this, uh, everyone work on this this semester. All right, for the late policy for the homework and projects, every student is allotted four slip days. So basically for any homework or project, you say, I, you know, I, if I'm a day late, you can decrement it from, from your count. So the B on, a, on each homework and the project submission, you just say how many late days you use, how many late days you have left. So, so sort of allow yourself to keep track of what, you know, how, how many late days you have. So 
after you run out of slip days, then it'll be you lose twenty five percent for every on the on the Simon's total points. Every time it's 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 for every twenty four hours that it's late. So again, this, we'll just keep track of this as we go along in the semester. Um, obviously, if there's medical conditions or other issues that come up, please contact me and we, we can accommodate you. So again, as I said before, all these projects and the homework should be done individually. They're not group assignments. You're not allowed to you know, work it out together and submit a single submission together. You should be doing everything individually. Now, some code for some projects may be still online from, from last or from previous years. Um, don't take that. We're going to run it through Moss, the plagiar, plagiarism checker. If we catch you running their shitty code, unfortunately, you know, we, we got to report you to Warner Hall. So don't do that because it's, it'll, you know, it's stupid. It'll fuck up your life and it makes everything harder, right? Just don't, don't plagiarize, okay? And again, if you're unsure, check the, the senior's academic policy or policy for academic integrity or contact me if you're unsure about what to do. And this includes also for the extra credit. And uh, just because it's extra credit and it's optional doesn't mean that you can't also get caught for plagiarism. So don't do that as well. And I'll remind you every single time we put a new project out, every single time you know, we, we talk about the extra credit. Okay? All right. So if you want to go beyond the kind of things we're talking about this, this course, if, if you really like databases, which I do, uh, you have no idea how much I love databases. Uh, the... If you want to go beyond the, the, the course material, there's two sort of ways to get involved in database research or other database topics going on at Carnegie Mellon. So the CMU database group has our weekly meetings on Mondays at 4.30 uh, in the Gates, Gates building on the A floor. And this is other students, visitors uh, from companies and, and people in Pittsburgh or from abroad coming and giving talks about what, you know, the, the kind of research or kind of work that they're doing. Um, if you want to get involved in the development uh, of, a, of, a, of a sort of advanced system, we have our team meetings on Tuesdays at 12 o'clock, uh, also in the Gates building. So we're building, in addition to BusTub, a BusTub sort of the academic system, we have a new sort of full featured database management system that we've been building for, for several years now um, that, again, if you want to get involved in this kind of stuff, uh, you should come check that out. And I'll send a reminder on this piazza. I will say also too, if you want to take the advanced class 15, 7, 21 in the spring, all those projects are based on, on this, this new, this other system we're building. Um, so if you want to get started on that and sort of learn, learn how that system works and get involved in the early days of this thing, you know, by all means come, come to this. Okay. So with that, that's, that's, that's it for the course. And again, please, if you have questions about things, post, post it, post them on Piazza and I'll respond. All right. So now let's talk about databases. Uh, the databases are super important in, in real life because they're used everywhere. So pretty much every single complex or any, any computer application you can think of, at the end of the day, deep down inside of it, there's going to be a database, right? If it's a mobile phone application, if it's running your desktop, if it's a website, Right, if it's some kind of complex computer simulation, at the end of the day, there's always a database. Everyone has database problems. Many things can then just be reduced down to database problems. So a database, the definition I like to use is that it's a, it's a collection of data that's related to the others in some way that's trying to model some aspect of the real world. Right? It's not just a bunch of loose files you have randomly sitting on your laptop. Right? In, that, in some ways, it's a database, but it's not really a useful one because you can't ask questions about it. So this data is usually related together or have some common theme to them, and it's trying to you know, model some aspect of something that's going on in reality. So the example I always like to use for this class is that, say we want to have a, a digital music store, right? something like Spotify or the iTunes uh, store. Right? And so, we're, so backing this application will be a database that's going to keep track of the various artists we have and, and their albums, right? So the, what we would put in this database would be basic information about their artists and then information about what albums that, that those artists have released, right? So that's, so that core right there, that's, that's, that's a database. So let's see how we actually could build now an application that could store this information. So let's say that 
you know, we don't know anything about database management systems, right? We don't know, we don't know about MySQL, we don't know about Oracle, we don't know about Postgres, we don't know about any of that. So we, in our own application, we're gonna write this code ourselves. So the simplest database we could implement and manage in our application would be just one where we store our data in a bunch of uh, comma separated value files or CFE files. And then in our application code, we're gonna write the, the, you know, the procedures, the methods, to read this data and extract information we need to answer questions or queries for them, right? So the way to think about this is like, for every for every entity we have in our application or in our database, like the artists and the albums, we'll store them in a separate file, like artists.csv, albums.csv, and then we'll have some code that knows how to open that file up, you know, parse each line to extract the different attributes about, uh, you know, that these things, these files are storing. Right, so let's say again we have two 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 entities in our in our in our database. Right, we have the artist. An artist has a name, a year, and a country, and then we have their albums. We have the name of the album, the artist that put out the album, and the year that put it out. Right, so again, if we're just storing this as CSV files, we would have quotation marks for each attribute, and then commas that would separate uh, it would separate them. So let's say now we want to write a query that could look at the artist uh you know the artist file and try to figure out the year that ice cube went solo so ice cube was a founding member of nwa here in la and then uh he he left them because of money disputes and he, he went solo so if we, again we have the csv file that has this artist information you know we could write some simple python code that would just iterate over every single line in the file right uh, you would have a function that would parse it, just basically split the line, split each line up by by its commas, and get back an array of attributes, and then we just check to see whether the first attribute equals ice cube, and if so, then we'll convert the second attribute to an integer because that's the year. And we just print that out, right? It's really simple uh, code to, to to answer this particular query. So there's some problems with this approach. So, and this, we'll go through these problems of why you don't want to manage data like this in your application, and this, this will motivate for why we want to build a, a sort of a general purpose or a, a database management system that can handle all these things. So the first question is say, you know, how can we ensure that in our application that for every single album that an artist puts out, the artist field in that album album file is is guaranteed to be the same like how do we know that we don't have a spelling mistake for ice cube right and, and then if we end up doing that how do we you know if say ice cube changes his name how do we make sure we fix all those things right the next issue is how do we ensure that the data we're storing is a valid is is valid for the different type right so the album year should be a four digit number but what happens if someone puts in a, a random string in that place, right? They can, anybody can open up the file and modify it because it's just a regular file on disk. Uh, but now our application start, does that parsing and it sees a random string when it expects to see an integer. And it's going to throw an error because it's like someone modified this data in a way that I that was not expected. And then the next issue is what if we have now an album that has multiple artists? Well, that's problematic because the way I set up my file uh, there's only one artist expect in field, right? So I, mean, I could try to store that within the quotation marks, a bunch, you know, a bunch of uh, comma separated values inside of that thing. But now I need to go look every single time I'm looking at the attribute and say, is this is you know is the is the artist name an array itself or is it just you know just a string? So again, you have to write all the specialized logic to, to deal with these you know these particular problems in in, in your in your application. So implementing this is not easy, right? So how do we actually find a record? So I showed my simple example was a for loop to iterate and parse every single uh, line to find the record that I was looking for. And so, you know, my my sample file had three lines, so that's not big of a deal, right? So that can be done pretty pretty fast. Well, you know, what if I had a billion, a billion albums? Do I really want to be opening the file every single time, scanning and parsing every single one to answer every single query? No, right, because that, that would be really, really slow. Now, next issue is that what if, say, you know, our application that I showed here was written in some sort of, it looked like Python code, 
Uh, but what if now I want to use, write another application that's written in another language, uh, and then I want to use that same database, right? So let's say that the, the example code I showed you was running on a web server, open up a file, parsing it, producing the answer. But now I have like a mobile phone application that wants, wants to access the same database. Well, my mobile phone application might not be written in Python, might be written in another language. So therefore, now I have to duplicate all my logic to parse that file in my in my web app or whatever other application. And of course, now how do I start sharing things, right? That, that becomes problematic, problematic as well, right? So again, same thing. What if, what if I have two threads or two programs, two processes running at the same time that want to write to the file at the same time? What's gonna happen, right? If, if I don't do anything special, then the first guy will write something, then the second guy might just overwrite it and I'll lose my changes to the first guy. So in that, now I start losing data, my data ends up being, uh, becoming invalid because it's getting garbled. So that's, that's problematic. All right, the, um, the last issue is how do I ensure that my data is safe? So let's say that I'm updating a record, I open a file, I start writing to it, but then before I finish writing my update, uh, the machine crashes, my program crashes. What happens, right? Should that update be there? Should it only be half updated, right? But how do I reason about what the correct state should be? What if I, again, I wanna say, well, I don't trust the machine that I'm running on, so therefore I wanna replicate my database, my files to a bunch of different machines so that if one machine crashes, the other one can just pick up and I can run, keep running without anybody noticing. And you say, oh, maybe I can use a distributed file system, but you know, th those things aren't general purpose usually, um, and that, that, that can be difficult to do. So for a variety of for these problems as well as others, uh, this is why you don't want to write the kind of stuff that we talked about of parsing a file and reading it in, in your application. You want to offload this, or uh, you want all that sort of complex logic of how to manage the data in the, the database. You want a database management system to manage that for you. So a database management system is specialized software that allows applications to store and analyze information in the database without having to worry about the underlying details of how to do that, right? And it's, it's, it's software that can be reused from one application to the next so that you're not reinventing the wheel all, all over again. So a general purpose data management system, the kind of things that we'll talk about in this semester are designed to allow applications to define, create, write queries against, update, and administer databases, right? And, and for our purposes, we're going to assume our databases are stored in disks. Uh, they don't necessarily have to be, like there's in-memory databases or the GPU databases or other things, right? For these, you know, we don't need to discuss those things yet, but just, just know that just be, there's, there's a variety of different databases out there that can do a bunch of different things or, have, or be specialized in different ways for a variety of applications. So again, I, I love databases a lot. Uh, I think about databases all the time. I love writing about databases or reading about databases. Um, and you may think, all right, this is crazy. Why would anybody love databases or data management systems so much? So you have to understand think about this. At CMU, it's a, we're a large school. We have courses and everything, right? Uh, you know, in this course is for operating systems, coursing for networking, things like that. But database management systems are sort of a special class of software that are so important that like there's full-time people like me that teach a course just on this, right? Like a web browser is important, but there's no class on like how to build a web browser, at least as far as I know, right? Whereas like databases are so prevalent and so widely used everywhere that like and they're really hard to, you know, work, you know, get implement correctly that, you know, we, we, there's an entire course like this course and talk about how to, how to build it. So again, I, I think they're a unique piece of software that or class of software that is uh, definitely a hot area right now. You know, at the end of the day, machine learning needs data. You store that in the database. Um, and, you know, so at every single application, as I said, well, at the end of the day, there's a database underneath it running uh, almost everything. So, this is why a course like this, in my opinion, is super important. All right, so databases are obviously, systems are not new. Um, the, it, you know, the first one came online, I think in like 1965 at General Electric. Um, 
and you know, people that are sort of in the early days of computing, and the people quickly realize, hey, it'd be nice to have specialized software like a database management system that can, you know can manage large data sets for us. So you have to understand, back in the day, it's not like how it was now. Um, in the early days, some things that we'll talk about in this course that we sort of take for granted now, because oh, of course, this is how, this is how you want to do certain things. Back in like the 1960s and 1970s, it wasn't obvious that this is the way to do things. So in particular, the story I like to talk about is back in like the you know, 19, late 1960s, there was this guy, uh, Ted Codd, who worked at IBM Research. He was a mathematician, but he got hired to work at IBM Research in, in New York. And he noticed that people that were working on databases spent a lot of their time rewriting the, their database application over and over again because the there was a tight coupling between the logical layers of what's in the database and the physical layers of how the data system was actually going to store it. So what I mean by that is like, say you have a database and you want to store it in, in this data management system and you have to tell the database management system, oh, I want you to store this as a hash table. Or I want you to store this as a tree. And then when you did that, it would then expose a different API for you based on what data structure you chose. But then now, say you change your mind, oh, you know, I, I told you I was a hash table, but I really want to run range queries on that. So now I, I want to do a, a, I want to be, you know, store it as a tree. So what you would have to do is dump all your data out, uh, change your application code to now make calls for the tree instead, API instead of the, the hash table API, and then you have to reload all your data back in, right? Because again, the, 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 whatever you, you explicitly told the data management system how you wanted it to store the data. So the Ted Codd realized that this was kind of stupid, right? This is problematic because it was people were basically refactoring the code all over and over again every single time there was ever a change like this. So now back then humans were cheaper than the computers, and so but you can easily see how this was not scalable. And nowadays computing is cheap with you know, Amazon and, and and Microsoft and Google have the cloud computing. And humans are an expensive thing, so it's this problem is even more problematic. You know, this issue is even more problematic today than it was back in the 1970s. But Ted Codd, you know, quickly realized that people were wasting their time in fixing up software that they didn't need to. So what Ted Codd proposed was this thing called the relational model. So he had the first paper came out on on this in uh, 1969, but the one that everyone cites is this one from the Communications of the ATM that came out in 1970. So most people read the one that the relational model of data for large shared data banks, but this, this is sort of the seminal paper that sort of started the whole relational data model revolution of saying this is how you want to store data independent systems. So this is very influential, influential uh, and this is, this is sort of the, the backbone of what we're talking about in this course. So there's sort of three key tenets of the relational model that Ted Cobb proposed. So the first is that we were going to store the database in simple data structures as, as relations. So a relation doesn't mean like, you know, I'm, you know, I'm related to my parents or whatever. It relation is, is essentially it's synonymous for a table. All right. It's the, it's a, it's the relationship between the attributes stored in, in, in the tuple for, for that given table. So again, we would define at a high level that we're going to store all our tables as, or our database as, as these relations. And then we would access them through a high level language, meaning we wouldn't write the exact code that we'd want the data system to execute in order to, to retrieve the data that we wanted. We would just say, hey, we want you to compute this answer. Please do it for me. We wouldn't actually say actually how to do it. So this idea was actually pretty, was really revolutionary because back then everyone was writing explicit procedural code. You know, here's the for loop to iterate through the table and find the data that I wanted. The example that I showed in the very beginning. This is how people write, wrote database applications before the relational model. Um, and, you know, this is actually pretty controversial at the time because everyone was saying, oh, there's no way software can ever produce a query plan that's as, as efficient as what a human can do. Right? This is sort of the same argument about, that people made in the 1970s about compilers. You know, they said, oh, you know, no compiler could ever write, you know, generate machine code as efficient as handwritten assembly. And of course, nowadays, nobody writes, or very few, few people write low-level assembly. Everybody writes in, you know, in high-level languages, and the compiler does a pretty good job producing a 
a the machine code to execute it more efficiently than what a human can do. Same thing was said back then, right? They, the compiler, or the database system couldn't produce a query plan that's efficient than what a human could do. And of course, nowadays we have very complex query plans. The optimizers aren't perfect, but they can probably do a better job than what most humans could do. All right, and then the last key idea was that the the physical storage uh, or the physical storage strategy for a given database was left up to the implementation of the database minutes system. So again, we define our, our database through these high level structures as relations, but how those relations are actually stored is completely up to the implementation of the database system. So the relational model doesn't say whether it should be in memory, should be on disk, how should we lay it out on disk, or how should we organize in memory. All that is, is transparent to the application. And so now the benefit of this is that if, uh, you know, for some applications, their database, you know, may want to be stored in one way. And then, and then over time, if the, the application evolves, it may be better to store it in another way. Uh, and then we don't have to rewrite our application because we're still writing at a high level language like SQL. Uh, and we're still accessing these relations, but underneath the covers, the database system can start moving things around for us or changing its layout, or, or, or recompiling certain things, uh, changing the data structures, and we don't have to change any of our application code. So we have a clean now, separate, clean separation between the logical and physical layers, which is absolutely what we want. All right, so the relational data model is, is not the only data model, though. Um, it's certainly the most widely used data model, and in my opinion, I think it's the best data model. Um, but there's, you know, there's different data models for different types of, of workloads. And it's, the relational data model is sort of a catch-all that can encompass a lot of things. It's not to say that the other ones are, are bad or in, are wrong. It's just the relational model, nine times out of ten, that's probably what you need. So, the, again, the data model is the high-level concept of how we're going to describe the data in our database. And then the, the schema that we provide for a given collection of the data in the database uh, is the definition of what we're actually storing it. So I'll show what I mean by this in a few slides, but the data model is essentially the high level concept of how we organize the, the data. And then the schema is to say, all right, well, what, the, what is the data we're actually storing for this application for this given data model? So again, as I said, the relational data model is just one of several other data models. I'm showing a small sample here. Um, Again, most data management systems that you know about today and the ones we'll cover in this course, MySQL, Postgres, Oracle, DB2, SQL Server, SQLite, all these are, are relational data, data, database systems, data, use the relational data model. Uh, if you're familiar with the term NoSQL, the NoSQL systems are usually these key value graph, document, or JSON, uh, or column family data models. And again, I'm not saying necessarily that the relational data model is better than these other ones. There's certain application domains where some of these are, are, are could better describe uh, the data than the relational data model, and the relational data model has certainly adopted some of these uh, some concepts or ideas from these other data models uh, in newer versions of it. It's just you know the, the relational data model can model all of these things. Um, it just with varying uh, with varying um, uh, benefit. Uh, or advantages over the, the, the sort of the, the basic data models. All right, you can also store arrays and matrices. That's considered a data model. This is mostly what this is. This is what people use in machine learning. All right, there are some databases that can store matrices and arrays. They're not that common. Um, uh, people usually use like data frames or you know some other things. That would be an example of a, a matrix data model. The hierarchical and network data model or the multi-value data model, there's a bunch of these other ones. Uh, these are more esoteric. Uh, these are what the original data models were used in the 1960s and 1970s, you know, sort of around the same time the relational data model came out. You almost never want, you almost never will see these things. You, if you're like a new startup or building an application for the first time, you definitely don't want to use any of these things. Uh, they're mostly in, in legacy applications. Yeah, it's just the remnants of old software. I, I would say this is not necessary to even consider them. So again, for our purposes, we're focused on the relational data model. That's what we care about in this course, and that's, that's what we're going to focus on. Because again, the relational data model can be used to model anything. 
So the relational data model is comprised of, of, of three parts. So again, the first is the structure of the relations. This is like the schema, how we're going to define what are in our relations, what their attributes are, what their types are, and so forth. Then we'll have the integrity constraints that we'll define to specify what is a valid instance of a database given given the structure, the given given the schema we provide. And then we'll have a way to manipulate and access the data in, 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 in our database, right? How do we actually run queries that can either extract information or, or modify the contents? So let's look, let's go back to our music store example and look at some, you know, some concrete examples of what, of what a relational model database looks like. So again, a relation is just an unordered set of, uh, of, of elements or, or records that have attributes that re represent entities, instances of entities in our relation. So again, an artist has a name, has a year and a country, and we can see in our relation example here, we, we, we have, you know, for each, each record, is sort of one row in this, in this diagram, and we have all the, the, those attributes. So we would refer to a, a record in the relational data model as, as a tuple, right? It's gonna be the set of attributes the, for that instance of an entity within our relation. So in the original data model, sorry, the original relational model produced, uh, written by Ted Codd in the 1970s, all these values had to be atomic or scalar values, meaning they couldn't be arrays, they couldn't be nested objects and so forth, right? You always had to be sort of, you know, it's one string, one integer, one, one float. So, Again, that's what the original data model, uh, relational data model, talked about. Um, but you know, in recent times, you, you know, you, you now can store arrays, you now can store JSON objects in relational databases. Right? That 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 particular restraint has been relaxed. Now, there's also going to be a special value in the domain of every attribute that we're going to store. They're called the null value. That means that you know the value is unknown. So that'll cause some problem when we start running SQL queries. But pretty much every every data management system supports supports uh, relational database system supports null values. But how you actually store them is left up in the implementation, and there's a bunch of different ways to do that, which I, I think is pretty interesting. All right, so then just so we're, you have, you understand the parlance, we'll say that a n area relation is one is a table uh, that has n columns, right? So it, I'll use the term relation. Uh, and, and table interchangeably, they mean the same thing for, for our discussions. I'll say tuple, sometimes I'll say record. I'll try not to say row because that's something very specific when we actually start talking about storage models. So, but all of those words can be used interchangeably as well. All right, so one thing we also have in our relational uh, model is primary keys. So a primary key is gonna be a unique attribute or set of attributes that can uniquely identify a single tuple. So, in this example here, uh, there's you know there, we actually don't have a primary key for any of our attributes because there could be other artists called the Wu Tang Clan. There there aren't, but there could be, right? There's nothing in our in our in our in, in the world that prevents somebody from calling them calling them that um, themselves that. So we can introduce a new ID field as a unique primary key so that you know if you're looking at the tuple with the ID one, two, three, you're explicitly looking at the, you know, the, the original Wu-Tang Clan. So in this example here, this is like a synthetic key that I've introduced into my, 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 my relation, my schema here, right? They're, in a real artist, they don't have an ID one, two, three. This is something we're using in our database minute system for this particular rate, relation to uniquely identify the tuple. So there's different ways to generate these things. Um, so there's some systems, at least in the SQL, SQL standard, where you can automatically generate these auto incrementing keys so that every single time I insert a new tuple, there's some counter that increments by one so that the, that new tuple gets that unique identifier. Um, other systems, if you don't specify a primary key, internally they'll create one. They don't really expose it to you, but uh, like they'll use that to keep track of this is the particular physical record or physical tuple that you're looking at. Right. For, for this example here, it's a synthetic one that's exposed through the logical layer. Um, so that could be, could, this could have been generated through an auto increment key. There's also foreign keys in the relational data model. So a foreign key is a way to specify that an attribute from one relation has to exist 
in at least one tuple in, in another relation. So this is how you're going to maintain integrity across different relations is so that you don't insert things that map to unknown or non-existing uh, entities in another table. So going back again to, to our example here, so we have the artist, we have the album, and so for the album uh, relation, we may want to store multiple artists that could all you know, collaborate on, a, on, a, on an album together. So we have this artist field now here, but in this particular example, right, for this mixtape, tape, there's multiple artists, so how do, I can't encode multiple values in the artist field because I said they had to be a scalar. So instead, I'll make this separate cross-reference table here where I'll have a foreign key reference from the artist ID that is part of this album and then the album ID that they're involved in. So now I can store multiple artists on a single album. And the database management system will keep track of the whether these albums and artist IDs actually exist in the real relation uh, so that prevents me from inserting an album that has artists that don't actually exist. Right? The data system can, can, can protect me from in inserting bad data. Um, and again, I avoid having to implement all that extra code in my, myself in my application, which again, relieves me from writing really hard code. All right, so now we want to talk about how we actually want to get data out of our database. Right? Again, I showed that simple example of writing the for loop, but I said that was a bad idea. We, want, we don't want to have to keep doing that for application. So what do we want to do? So the DML is a way to manipulate the data and, and, and either accessing it or modifying it in a way that produces the result that we're looking for. So there's two ways we could do this. So the first is procedural meaning we'll specify at a high level st strategy of how the data system should find our, our particular result that we're looking for. So I don't mean exactly like the procedural code, the Python example I showed before, but just sort of a high level say, hey, this is, this is what we want you to execute. The other approach is called non-procedural um, or declarative. And this is where we're gonna say, this is what we want, this is the answer we want the data system to generate for us but we're not gonna specify how to actually produce it or actually how to go about and getting it. So we're just gonna say, hey, at a high level, do this, and we hope the data system can do it, for, maybe figure out how, an efficient way to do it for us. So the, we're gonna talk about now is relational algebra, and this would be an example of a procedural language. Um, and relational algebra is it's not hard to understand. It'll come up later on when we talk about uh, query execution. Um, but you know, this is what sort of what, what Ted Codd originally proposed in the 1970s. A non-procedural example would be something like relational calculus. And so we don't need to discuss this at all. Uh, not because I don't, you know, I don't think it's actually necessary, um, at least for our purposes in this, this course. But relational calculus will come up if you if we start going into detail about query optimization, because you, you have to use calculus to to derive uh, efficient query plans and do pruning and things like that. So again, for this for this course, we only need to focus on relational algebra. I'm just bringing up relational calculus to say that it exists, that it's out there. It's an example of a non-procedural language, but for our purposes here, we don't need it. All right, so Ted Cobb proposed uh, uh, seven fundamental operators in, in, in the relational algebra. So these, again, these are the fundamental operators we have to retrieve, manipulate tuples in a relation to produce answers that we're looking for. So one important thing to mention is that this algebra is based on, on sets. So a set is an unordered list or unordered uh, collection of data um, where you cannot have uh, unique values. Now, when we talk about SQL, SQL is not going to be based on set algebra, even though it uses relational algebra as the underlying operators for doing query execution. And I'll, I'll explain again when we talk about SQL next time what that means. So the way this is going to work is that each of our relational operators is going to take in one or more relations as its input, and then it's always going to output a new relation. And so the idea is that we're, we're going to compose complex queries by chaining together these relational operators together uh, to you know, produce the answer that we're looking for. So these are like the primitives you would use to, to do some operation on the data, on tuples, and then to produce a com more complex query, we, 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 we put them together. So we, just, we select projection, union, intersection, difference, product, and join. So again, these are the fundamental ones, and we'll go through each of these. So the first one is select. Select is basically taking a subset of the tuples 
that satisfies some selection predicate. So you can sort of think of this as like a filter. You say, here's for a, a given input relation, here's the predicate that I want you to evaluate for every single tuple. And if it evaluates to true, meaning the predicate is satisfied for a particular tuple, we'll add it to our output uh, our output relation for this for the select operator. So the, the easy way to remember this, the, the word select starts with an S, and so the relational operator is, is a sigma, which also starts with S. So you would say, here's, I wanna, uh, I wanna, for this given input relation, here's a predicate to run and we produce our output. So doing a real simple example here, say we have a simple relation, has two attributes, AID and BID. And so we could do a select operator like this that says, find me all the tuples where AID equals A2. And then our output would be uh, a new relation with these two tables and the same uh, schema or the same attributes as the, as the input relation. I also can combine together uh, using Boolean logic, combine together uh, more complex predicates. So I can say where AID equals two and BID is greater than 102. Um, and again, we're not specifying in the order in which you apply those predicates, right? Because it could be more expensive to do one versus the other. That's all left up to the data center system just to decide on its own what to do. So now, if you know SQL, the way this would write, we just write this in SQL that for that second example, it's just think of the, the select operators as like the where clause, right? So you say where a, AID equals two and BID is greater than one or two, right? That that's the, that's a translation of that of this select operator into into SQL here. All right. So the next operator is projection, and and here what we're doing is we're we're, we're going to generate a new output relation that contains only a subset of the specified attributes from our input relation, right? So you would say, here's my input relation, and then my projection is, here's the attributes that I only want you to, to emit to produce in the output. And again, projection starts with the P, it uses a lowercase pi symbol, so it's, it's sort of easy to remember the, that there's, the, the, which one it is. So again, here's our simple example with uh, relation R with AID, BID. So in this case here, I can have a uh, I first do a select to just produce all the uh, tuples of R where A, I, D equals two. And then now in my projection clause, I can say, I want the B, I, D value subtracted by 100, and then as well as the A, I, D value. So I can reorder my attributes any way that I want, and then I can manipulate it in any way I want with any kind of arithmetic or kind of string function operator. Um, so again, in SQL, it would look like this. So you have in the output clause of your select statement, you would say BID less than 100 and AID. And then and the where clause is just you know, what you did in the select operator. All right, union operator is where we're gonna take two relations um, and we're gonna produce a new output relation that contains all the tuples in either the first relation or the, or the second relation or both of them. Right? You, just, you just combine these two relations and mash them together. Right? So if you do the union on R and S, you get a, a giant, uh, you know, you, you get a, you get a, you're basically concatenating S on, to, on R as the output. And so for this particular operator, you have to have the same attributes with the same type in the two relations you're trying to union together, right? So in this case here, if S had, uh, you know, if had a third attribute, you wouldn't be able to take the union because it, it wouldn't match. So in SQL, there is a, a union all operator so the union one is is not exactly the same as the union operator in uh, in relational algebra. You have to add this all qualifier to get it to do what exactly what you want to do. So again, we'll we'll discuss what the difference of these two is in the next lecture. There's also intersection, same thing. So now what you're doing is you're taking all the uh, you're taking for both the in, the two input relations. You're just going to produce the output relation that, that has tuples that appear in both the two input relations. So again, taking the union R and S here, uh, we'll just produce a single tuple that has, you know, or sorry, a single relation that has one tuple, A, A3 and 103. So again, you have to have the same number of attributes of the same type and the same name in relational algebra in order for this union to work. And then there's the intersect keyword in, in, uh, in SQL that will do the same thing. Difference is where you take all the tuples that are, appear in the first relation, but not the second relation. So again, I can take the, the R 
The difference of R and S is just all the tuples that don't appear in an S that appear in R. So in this case, A, A3103 appears both in R and S, and so it's excluded in the output, but A1, A2 don't appear in S, so they're in the output. And in SQL, you use the accept keyword, or accept, accept operator, to perform the same kind of operation. All right, the, the second last one to do is the product operator. So this is also sometimes called a Cartesian product, or if you know SQL, this is, I think, called a cross-join. So basically, you just want to generate all combinations of, of all tuples from the two input relations. So you're basically just taking the cross product of these two and just producing a giant output of every single unique combination of all of them. So again, in, in SQL, you use cross-join, or if you don't actually specify that what the join is at all, you, you get this output here like that. So you may think this is kind of stupid, and this is like what you not might want to do. Uh, you never want to do this, but this actually appears sometimes in testing, um, some you know testing applications where you want to say, give me all the unique combinations of, of different configurations of the thing I'm actually trying to test, and this is a really simple way to actually do that. All right, the last I'm going to talk about is to do joins. So this particular join is called a natural join. It's not the kind of joins we'll talk about uh, in the future, but or it's not necessarily the type of join we're talking about in the future, but this is very explicitly talking about a natural join. So the way the natural join works is that you, for every single tuple in the output out one relation, you see whether it matches all the attributes in the other relation that have the same name, the same type, so the common values of them. Right? So in this case here, if I want to do a natural join on R and S, uh, I look at AID and see whether I find a match. I look at the AID in R, see whether I have an AID match in S, and then if I do, then I check to see whether I have also a BID match uh, from R and S, and then if I do, then that produces the output here. So again, A3103 exists both in R and exists both in S, and it can produce the output. So in SQL, there's a natural join operator like this, Again, notice I'm not specifying how I want to do the join. It knows that I'm looking to see whether I had matches based on just the name here. So the reason why this is different than the difference is because there could be additional attributes in R and S that don't that don't have the same name in you know shared across the two relations, and so they'll they will actually be produced in the output. Um, so the scheme is allowed to be different as long as there's some common common attributes that you're doing the natural join on, where in the difference, in the difference operator, you have, a, you have to have exactly the same attributes of the same type. All right, so these, again, these are just the, the original main seven uh, relational operators, relational algebra operators that Ted Kopp proposed. Since then, there's been a lot of research and been a lot of additional stuff uh, that people have added, right? So, like there's things like doing sorting or order pies, where we know we want to do that in SQL. The original relational model proposal doesn't talk about these things. Relational algebra proposal doesn't talk about these things. But people have since extended the relational algebra and include, include these other ones. So doing rename, assignment, duplicate elimination, aggregations or group buys, uh, sorting division. So again, we may see some of these, we'll see certainly see aggregations and sorting uh, later on. Uh, you know, this is just to say that there's, there's placeholder algebra, algebra operators that we have, may have to consider when we start doing query planning or doing query execution. All right, so to finish up, I just want to sort of point out one particular thing. So the relational algebra is still pretty high level um, compared to like our for loops as before because we're, we're not specifying anything about what the, how the data is stored in terms of like its data structure and so forth, we're just saying at a high level, hey, you know, scan this table and, and do a filter, right? Um, but it's still at the end of the day, it's still kind of telling you what steps, in the order which, which you, you should perform these steps. So again, let's say I want to do a join between R and S and, and then I want to filter out any tuple where, you know, filter, and only produce the tuples where the BID equals 102. So I have two examples of two relational algebra expressions to execute this query. So in the first one here, I do the natural join on R and S first, and then I do my filter on BID equals 102. And then in the second example here, I do the filtering on S first, where BID equals 102, and then I take the output of that relation, and then I do the natural join. So 
again, you may think at a high level, these are these, at a high level, these are the same thing. They're producing the same result, but the performance characteristics or the, the the how efficient the data system will execute these two query plans can be vastly different, right? Like, say I have a billion tuples in R and S, and there's only one tuple in S where B I D equals one of two. So if I do the join first, I'm going to take a join a billion tuples with a billion tuples. And then I'm going to scan through and just find that one tuple where BID equals 102. Whereas in the second plan, I could do the scan on S first, find that one tuple where BID equals 102. And then now I'm joining that, you know, with that one tuple with the billion tuples in R. So again, even though we're not getting at the low level, like you run this for loop and do that, it's it's still still specifying relation out of the steps we actually want to the data set to use to execute for our query plan. So what we really want to do is be able to just say at a high level, tell the database system, hey, this is the answer I want you to compute and not actually specify how you want it to compute it. So I want to say, hey, go just give me all the tuples joined from RNS where BID equals 102. Didn't say whether you should scan S first or join, join with R first. I say, this is the answer that I want. And the reason why we want to do this is again, because to, now in our application, we just specify this high level answer we want the system to compute. And it, you know, if our table or if our database is really small today, and then it grows really big a year from now, I don't have to change that in my code. The database system could figure out, oh, well, you had a small table, small database before. I want to execute it one way, but now you have a billion tuples in S, and maybe I want to do the filtering first. But I didn't have to change my application code to make it do that. Right? The data system could do this for me. So this is what we're going to try to do by in running queries. In particular, we want to run SQL. And so the key thing to understand is that Although SQL is the standard way people express queries for run the relational model, it isn't the only way you could do this. It just happened to be the one that everyone uses and you know standardize on. And actually, when Ted Codd wrote the, the relational model paper first in 1970, he actually didn't even propose SQL. He didn't even propose any high-level language. He just said, hey, here's a relational algebra. He then later proposed uh, his own language called Alpha that uh, you know, was it a competitor to SQL in the 1970s? Of course, you've never heard of it because no one ever used it. Um, and actually, in the 1970s, there was two other competing, there was another competing language with SQL. There's another thing called Quell out of Berkeley uh, for the system called Ingress. And they both look similar. You know, Quell and Alpha and, and, and SQL sort of look similar to each other, but of course, the syntax is, is, is very different. Um, it just so happened again, SQL just, is, just sort of one out. It's what everyone uses today because IBM invented it. So the way you think about this is that, again, this is what I showed the very before. This is like the lowest level way you could actually execute this query of finding all the, the you know, finding when Ice Cube went solo. But instead, I could just write a really simple SQL query like this and say, this is the answer that I want you to produce. And then the data system could then figure out, oh, the, I, I want to write it in this particular for loop, uh, you know, because that's the best way to do this. Or And then if I add indexes, then the query plan could change, right? So... The beauty of the relational model in SQL is that we can write these high-level queries that we want, and then over time, as the database changes, as the database, uh, as the system itself changes, or our workload changes, it can adapt and improve itself without ever us having to go back or change our application. Again, for, so for this reason, that's why I'm super excited about the relational model, and I, I think it's always the right way to go. All right, so just to finish up here, um, and again, I realize it's it's awkward for me sitting here in the bathtub giving you this lecture. Um, so I appreciate you guys sitting through this. So databases are ubiquitous. Databases are super important. Databases are everywhere. So no matter what you do throughout your life, even if you don't go, you know, you know, if you don't go in the field of databases, you don't even go in the field of computer science or computer programming, I guarantee you throughout the rest of your life, you're going to come across databases. And it's going to be important for you to understand how they actually work on the inside, right? Because when things don't, you know, things aren't working the way they should think to be working, you need to know, oh, it's written this way. This is what it's actually doing so that you can figure out how to actually improve things. So the, we discussed the relational model. We discussed the relational algebra. Uh, and we showed how we, these are the primitives we could use to, to essentially use them as the building blocks to generate queries that we can execute on a relational database to update it and derive answers. 
So we'll see relational algebra again later in the semester when we talk about query optimization, query execution. But just in the back of your mind as you write SQL queries for the first homework, you should be thinking about, oh, well, how would, you know, the database system is translating these into relational algebra. Sort of think about how it is actually doing it, how it actually execute these things. Okay, I almost forgot one last thing. The most important thing you need to understand about databases throughout this, through the rest of your life is the following. When you look back at the 36 chambers, you understand who were the original nine involved in it. You have the RZA, the JZA, Inspected Deck, Ghostface Killer, Master Killer, You God, Meth Man, Old Dirty Bastard, and Raekwon. But the other important thing too is Capadonna was in jail at the time, so he was actually an original member of the clan, but because he was in jail, he couldn't be, he couldn't be on the 36 chambers. So that's the most important thing you need to understand throughout this entire semester. Okay? All right, guys. See you next time. Oh, dear, coming through with my shell and crew. Two cents for a case, give me St. Oz proof. In the midst of broken bottles and crushed up cans, met the cows in the jam, oh, how dry I with St. Ives in my system, crack another, I'm blessed, let's go get the next one and get over, the object is to stay sober, lay on the sofa, better yet, down my shoulder. Who be the wallaby champ, stressed out, could never be son, Rick and say jelly, hit the deli for a cold one, naturally blessed, yes, my rap is like a laser beam, the bones in the bushes, St. Ives, St. Ives, the canteen. Crack the bottle of the St. Ives, sip it through those who don't realize, the drinking ain't only to be drunk, you can't drive, keep my people still alive, and if the saint don't know you're from a can of pain, pain.